Hey everyone, it's Rob Stanley with the Ecom Wiz podcast. And today my special guest is Amy Weiss. She's founder and CEO of Amazing at Home Business Consulting. Hi, Amy. Hello, Rob. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. We've been working on getting you on for a couple months now. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, or the topic of the show today is going to be how to do Amazon product research without software. But before we dive into that, I want to ask you a few other questions like, a big question that keeps coming up is, is this a good time for sellers to be selling on Amazon, or people to be selling on Amazon? Yes, I think so. I mean, um, you know, Amazon is just one channel in e-commerce, right? It's just one sales channel, but it's a really, really large sales channel. I mean, it's like, it, it's over 50% of e-commerce now. So I think that it's a wonderful time to be selling on Amazon. I think you'd be crazy to skip Amazon, but I also think that you should take advantage of other channels um, as well. Yeah. So other channels like eBay or like say a Shopify store, what's your thought on that? Well, I think it really depends on your business and your product and your niche, right? So um, there are certain products that don't sell as well on Amazon anymore. And one example I have is like high-end products, for example. Those used to do really well. High-end private label brands used to be able to put their products on Amazon and they could, you know, really have no presence off of Amazon and those things would sell like hotcakes and they could be a hundred dollars over, you know, their closest competitor. And if they just had really good pictures and really good branding, they could sell. But nowadays with all the factories getting smarter and directly listing themselves on Amazon, it's really hard. So I have a lot of clients that have like products like um, high-end housewares, you know, like that gold vase, you know, and they're trying to sell it for much, much higher price point than the rest of the $19 gold vases that are on Amazon. And you used to be able to do that, but now your channel is probably better. If you go on wayfair.com and you look up mm -hmm. gold vase, the average price is 70 to $200. You go on Amazon and you look up that same gold vase they're very nice looking at $19. Yeah. So, you know, Amazon has kind of become the Walmart, right? For, um, for kind of those, the Walmart or Kmart of those higher end homewares now. So I think it just depends on your product and your niche and where you can get the best price for your product, the, bre the best representation for your brand and um, some really get great profitability. Yeah, that's, that's great information. And that's actually very true is finding that, that platform to sell it on that fits what you're selling can really make a difference in your sales and your sales volume. I know you do a lot of consulting and we'll get into that a little bit later, but how has some of uh, this coronavirus issue affected some of your sellers? What have you seen and what's some of the challenges they're facing right now? Well, I think the biggest thing is when Amazon really focused on essentials and delayed delivery, so many people lost their, their most, the bulk of their sales. And, you know, luckily me with my private label brands, I have a warehouse right here and I order in bulk and keep stuff in the U.S. at my warehouse. So I wasn't, a lot of people who had air shipping were really affected. So if they needed to order something new, well, all the flights were canceled, right? They couldn't yeah. get in an air shipment where, you know, I already had everything here and I was able to very quickly pivot to Merchant Fulfilled and go to other channels as well that weren't delaying uh, shipments. And so our sales tripled. Meanwhile, and we took over some, some of the top sellers in different categories simply because we pivoted to, um, we pivoted to Merchant Fulfilling. So what I did with my clients is I helped them learn how to use FBA inventory to merchant fulfill, taught them how to list again, taught them how to use prep centers, whatever I could do to help them pivot and help them get those delivery times down so that they could recover their sales. Yeah. And do you think coming up uh, that we may see more Amazon sellers shifting to that model where they maybe have some fulfillment centers holding on to some of their product and not just you know, basically putting everything into Amazon, uh, you know, warehouses. Do you think that we're going to see that a bit more since uh, kind of this was a learning experience? Yeah, especially because, you know, Amazon held a lot of the stuff hostage too. Like you couldn't even do a removal order and get your stuff out. And, you know, I don't think anyone thinks that this is going to happen again. 
but it's a good lesson in contingency planning. And I think a lot of us explored other channels during this time. We explored merchant fulfilling, we explored other channels. And so it became more important to be able to be versatile with our inventory. Absolutely. All right. So let's dive right, right into what we were uh, basically headlining this whole podcast about. And why don't we start off with telling people about what do you do when you're researching a product? You know, you, we talked about ne not necessarily using tools, but what kind of methods are you using and step us through that process? Well, you know, I do tend to st stick to my niche, which is I'm in the pet niche. So I kind of stick to my niche. Um, and what I do is I actually do a lot of social listening and I study the market. So I see, and what that means is I wanna know what kind of things people are searching for in on the internet across the internet I want to know what kind of things people are searching for I want to know what kind of problems they're talking about and I want to know what kind of things you know make them happy what kind of things they're talking about what kind of things are trending across you know social media channels and conversations online and I then use that information to find opportunities to bring a really cool product to market that meets their needs that isn't being sold. So those kind of products aren't gonna be found on any product research software. And that is what's so cool because they're immediately in demand, but I'm not worried about a whole bunch of other people using the same search filters as me, finding the same exact product, looking at a bunch of bad reviews, making the same differentiation as me and bringing it to market. So I go to the market first and, and follow that process. Yeah, social listening is very crucial nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of people who have built big companies based off just going out there and finding what are people talking about, the issues are with XYZ, you know, a niche or category they're in, and then coming up with a solution for it or go having a solution made. I mean, I was kind of in the same situation with my iPhone business, right? Like prior to the iPhone, we were doing repairs on other electronic devices and we would have people email in and say, oh, do you carry a part for this? And I'd go research like how many people have that device? How many people are looking for, a re you know, a part for that device? Is that something we should add in? So I absolutely agree with you 100% on this that, you know, that's something people should do. And I, I was just on a podcast last week that was asking me that same question. And I basically said that, you know, I'm a golfer, right? And I started uh, golf opened back up a couple of weeks ago and I got on and I was like, okay, I found out a lot of the carts were being taken, like the actually electric golf carts were being taken early in the morning. So if you golfed a little later, you didn't get a cart, you had to walk. So when I went onto Amazon or any of the platforms researching for a push cart to carry my bag, they were all sold out and nobody had any. So all of a sudden the ones that were there were twice as expensive. So I was like, oh my gosh, man, too bad I wasn't selling on Amazon still. I would, I would try to see how fast I could get carts in and start selling those. I mean, and by the way, don't go do that. You're probably going to be too late by the time you get them. I'm sure the market will come back down, but that's a great example, right? I mean, those are definitely mm -hmm. things that you do. Now, so when it comes to product research and software, um, we are specifically talking about product research and, and not using software and finding that niche. And, but there is times you use software, right? So tell us about when is the right time to use software and tools uh, when you're selling on Amazon? Well, I think when you are moving through the process of validating that idea, mm -hmm. right? So you can study the market and you know, the, the problem as we mentioned with starting with products is you just get this tunnel vision and you're like, okay, I want to be in the kitchen and you know, I teach other people how to do this market research. So I don't just stick to the pet niche. I have different exercises that I give people to run through to actually, you know, come up with product ideas and choose their niches and get into this market research and you know, all of that. And uh, I have a whole process that I take people through and you know, that would take us 10 hours today on the <laughs> podcast. So we won't go there, but I would love to give you guys some absolute value. Right. Um, but in terms of you know the tools that you use the internet is at our disposal right so if i'm thinking about you know if i'm just thinking about launching a product that um you know maybe somebody's talking about um you know 
uh, I always use the water bottle because it's right on my desk, right? Yeah. But if I think, okay, you know what? How can I make this different? Um, I want to make it for people who are out at walking at night with their dogs. I'm going to add lights to this water bottle because then I don't have to use my phone flashlight that's going to run out, right? I can bring something for hikers or for walkers at night that they can see at night and build it right into the water bottle. Okay. I'm going to put lights in this water bottle. Seems like a good idea, right, Robbie? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, we need to find out, is anyone searching for a water bottle with lights, right? Probably not, but <laughs> I get right, where you're going. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but we have the we have the internet at our disposal. So if our idea is light up water bottle, you know, we can list all of the things that we could call this. Yeah. And we yeah. have to find out, okay, what are people what kind of questions are people asking about water bottles? Well, we can go to answerthepublic.com and we can type in water bottle. And we can see what kind of things people are talking about, right? It'll tell us all the questions people asking about water bottles across the internet. And we might get some really cool ideas from that, right? But we could also just search. We could use the search bar. That's my favorite tool because the search engine wants to make people happy. And Google is one of the most popular search engines. Why? Because it shows the most relevant search results. Amazon is another popular search engine. Why? Because it converts at a six times higher rate than the closest e-com competitor. Why? Because they show the most relevant results to their shoppers. They are really good at that. So that's what we want to do. We want to just type in water bottle in the search bar and start seeing what those suggestions are. Because guess what? The cream is going to rise to the top. We are going to see what people are searching for when it comes to water bottle. And then we can put things, uh, other words, you know, in there. We can put water bottle with and see what the suggestions are. We can put water bottle for and see what the suggestions are. So now, instead of just looking at all the products that are on the market, all the water bottles that are on the market and copying yet again, I can instead go to the internet and see what kind of things people are actually searching for in terms of water bottle for and with and you know verses you can look up verses like think other things people are considering besides water bottles right and that is going to give you some really great ideas and so then i can go into light up water bottles i can type that in or water bottle with lights and i can see if there's any kind of blog post maybe somebody's diying it diy is another really great way to find great product ideas. If people are DIYing it, it's because it, the solution is not good enough on the market. Yep. So that is a really great way. If somebody's selling it on Etsy and it's selling well, that's a really great thing for you to look. For. I'm not saying go jump on Amazon and throw it on Amazon right away. I'm saying go back to your research, start researching it more, see what kind of blogs are being written about that. Go on Pinterest, see what kind of pins are, are you know, pinned about that. Go on Reddit, see what kind of conversations people are having. You are going to just be ingrained in this and you're going to have a really good feeling. You know, my, the whole point of my curriculum is helping people launch their products with confidence. Yeah. The reason you don't have confidence is because you aren't sure if people are going to buy your product. Well, guess what? There's plenty of resources at your disposal. So those are the tools that I use. And then when it comes to Amazon, right? Of course, I'm gonna go on Amazon during that time. I'm gonna use the search bar. I'm gonna see what the results are that pop up. I love the Chrome extension, DS Amazon Quick View, because it shows me the search ranks right on the page. And being an old retail arbitrage seller, I love seeing Amazon BSRs on the page. I don't need Jungle Scout, I don't need that Helium 10 x extension. Now I love it, I still use it, right? But I like to look at page one and see what the ranks are all the way across page one. And so, and then I like to imagine my product because I know PPC, I teach PPC. I know I can pay for a spot at the top of that keyword, yeah. right? But I wanna make sure that my product is gonna stand out on that page and that it's gonna convert. And I'm gonna know that it's gonna convert because I did the research. I know what the customers care about. And I can't tell you, Robbie, how many times I have had a consulting call with somebody and we're talking about product launch. And I go, all right, give me three forms of external traffic that you're gonna use for your product launch. And they go, uh, 
what what's what's huh what's external tra okay well where does your customer hang out uh you don't even know who your customer is yeah. right that's a problem you want to know who your customer is buying is a psychological process you want to connect with them and it's going to make all the difference in the world for you Amy, you're awesome. Welcome back to the Amy uh, podcast. So just kidding. <laughs> so, I love having people on that actually do podcasts because Amy just, she will probably sit here for an hour and just tell you guys information. And that's great, right? I, I mean, nobody wants to listen to me. They want to listen to you because you're, you're spewing out the facts and the real information. And that is just awesome. But I do have a few more questions to ask you. So we're going to move on. All right. So Amy, and staying kind of on that track though, what makes up or defines a good product to sell on Amazon then? Okay, well, this is what you have to ask yourself with all of your products. So the first thing is, can you, what's, what's different about your product, right? What's different about your product? If, if I asked you, if, if I was saying, I'm gonna sell this water bottle, right? And I asked you, okay, well, why should I buy that? Tell me you're, we're at a marketplace right now and you got a table full of your water bottles. <laughs> what is going to make me stop at your table? Why, you know, why should I buy your product and not your competitors? Yeah. If you, so that's the first question that you have to be able to answer, right? That first question, well, why should I buy your product instead of your competitors? Well, my product has lights. My water bottle has lights. And when you're walking with your dog at night and you don't want to use your phone flashlight, you've got your water bottle built right in. It's something that's with you and you can feel safe walking with your dog at night or just walking at night. Maybe you're going out jogging. My water bottle has you covered. Maybe you're going from your, your car from work to your car at night. Well, now you, you got your water bottle and it's your flashlight at the same time. Great for peace of mind. And it's made of steel so you can beat that person <laughs> over the head if they come and try to attack you, right? So anyway, you know, I'm selling my water bottle to you, right? Well, the second question you have to answer after the first one, why should I buy it from you? The second question is, does your differentiation matter to the customer? So I've seen so many people go, well, Amy, my water bottle is green and there are no other green water bottles on the market. I mean, this is the thing, like it's gonna stand out on the page, it's gonna be great. Well, guess what? There's no perceived value in your green colored water bottle, nobody cares. So that's the problem. I was on a client call the other day and they took the time to differentiate this product that they were working on and um, they looked at bad reviews, right? And they, they made the product a little bit easier to use. And the problem was it looks the same as all the other products on the page. Yeah. There's no standout. It's the same shape and everything, even though there's a slightly longer, slightly bigger, there's, you can't tell by the main photo. And so it's not different than the hundreds of other products on the page. So question one, why should they buy from you? They could answer, well, we made ours, you know, longer and bigger and it actually has more coverage area and it's, it's a better product. Okay, but does that matter to the customer? They couldn't yeah. answer that question, right? They they know that it matters because it's it is you know uh, was in the bad reviews, but we don't know if it matters when they're going to buy it, and they have to choose between all those products on the page, right? So those are your first two questions, and then the third question you absolutely must answer, and this is absolutely critical, is is it profitable? You've got to have a profitable product. If it's not profitable, you got to walk away from it, right? I teach my people, you got to at least, at least have a minimum 7X multiplier. That's with shipping. For Amazon, I love a 10X multiplier because have you noticed fees have gone up, yeah. right? That means if I source this water bottle for a dollar, I better be able to sell it for 10. So that's the thing is, you know, and I've run this again and again and again with so many products. So many people don't know how to calculate their advertising costs into their profits. So we run those numbers in our classes and people are just astonished. Like, you know, and then what we do, we do this really fun exercise, which I don't think anyone else is teaching numbers this way. I'm, I'm zany this way, but um, we do this, this exercise where I make you calculate how much you could pay yourself 
based on the hours that you worked in your business. So your profits, after you subtract advertising and expenses, um, could you pay yourself? And yeah, a lot yeah. of people are losing money and other people are at a dollar an hour. And I'm like, hey, McDonald's is looking pretty good right now, right? So, <laughs> I mean, that really, you know, and, and then I've got some clients that have those products that, you know, they, they're starter products and they're learning products and their margins and their multipliers are not good. But they're like, yeah, but I mean, it's selling. And if I can just make 30 cents off each one, you know, maybe I should make another order. That's the third, you know, people are always asking, should I make another order? And the big thing there is, well, how much do you want to pay yourself? What is your effort and your time worth? And you know, it's absolutely possible to source at better multipliers and to do better business. And there's plenty of opportunity out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I'm going to play off with everything you just said in the sense that also take a look at you know, a lot of people want to jump in and just do what everybody else is doing, right? Like if, if water bottles are selling great, they want to sell water bottles with a slightly different look or feel to it, right? And that, don't get into that. That, that is not the way to go is jumping into the same categories everybody else is doing because if you did all your homework and you see the top person's making millions of dollars selling water bottles, right? I always approached it as, and, and of course it was on a different side, it was on the iPhone side, what accessories can I sell? Now, please don't get into iPhone accessory business, the hardest <laughs> business to be in. I got into it when the iPhone first came out in 07. Okay. So taking the water bottle example, I was sitting here brainstorming why Amy was talking. I'm thinking to myself, lids, you can do all kinds of sports lids, different kinds of lids form, right? That might be a category. Now, like Amy said, you're going to want to go and research what are those people, what are people struggling with that are using their, these water bottles? Okay. Maybe it's a sleeve that goes around it that keeps it colder for longer. Or maybe it's a sleeve that goes around that has a clip on it that clips onto something. You know, it, if you think about the millions of water bottles out there, what accessory could you make that may, or, or even find, you don't necessarily have to make it, find that nobody has caught on to that could be a great item to go with those millions and millions of water bottles that have been sold. So that's another, another way to kind of think of finding a product. And Amy's absolutely right. You got to pay yourself. I mean, don't just struggle along with 30 cent items. I mean, if you're doing this as a side thing and you have a full-time job, okay, then technically that 30 cents is just extra money. But if you're trying to get this to a point where it's a full-time job and you're living off of it, you got to, you know, okay, use that as, an, as a good way of, hey, this was my first product and I, at least I made something on it. Now it's time to move on to the next product, right? Yes. So can I give an example of an exercise yes. that I give people to do? Because I think it's hard for people. They go, yeah, but Robbie, I can't think of something, some accessory. I don't, I'm not creative. Like that. I always hear that. I'm not creative, you know? So I'm going to give you guys an exercise to do that is going to really help you come up with this idea. And I'm going to tell you about an idea that I came up with for a phone accessory based on using this idea. So I want you guys to make a list of everything that you bought in the last three to six months. I want you to make a list, everything. Go to your Amazon orders if you're like me. <laughs> like, Pages. I bought, I bought that on Amazon, right? Um, go to your Amazon orders and, uh, and take a look and see everything that you bought. I want you to write it down on a piece of paper, everything that you bought. Now, next to that, next to that thing that you bought, I want you to put why you bought it and then why you chose that particular item. Did you choose it because it was the cheapest on the page? Yeah. It's a very common item. Did you choose it because you trusted the brand? Did you choose it because it looked interesting or better than the rest of the items on the page? Were reviews important to you? What were the decisions that you made in that purchasing? So, one of the items that I bought, right, was a charging cable for my phone. And yeah. let me tell you, I have been buying those things and buying those things and buying those things. And so the first question we have to ask is, why did I buy that? Because I keep freaking losing my phone charging cables. They go, my kids steal them, they go everywhere, and I'm just gonna buy them in bulk, right? So <laughs> I'm like, man, why did I buy that phone charging cable? Okay, because I keep losing them. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. 
there's a problem for us to solve. Yeah, absolutely. Let's not look at the phone charging cable because we're not going to get in there. Robbie says, ignore the phone accessories <laughs> market, right? You don't want to go there, but maybe you do. So let's put that problem of I keep losing my phone cables in the yeah. center of a piece of paper. How can we solve the problem of losing our phone cables? So now I start thinking through, why the hell do I keep losing my phone cables? Okay, I put it down. I got one in my car. I got one over here. I always use those battery chargers. I'll wrap it around the battery charger and I'll plug it into my phone and I'll keep it in my purse whenever I, I know every conference, you guys should look at my purse in the conferences because I've been in my phone all day, right? And so it's never near my phone where I need it. Yeah. And so I wish there was a phone charger of cable that was like attached to my phone, but then that would be annoying, right? But then and how do I get to the, the battery? Well, there's usually a battery or a plug somewhere. Yeah. I could just Absolutely. keep the cable around. And then I was like, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be great if I had a phone case that had an integrated charging cable retractable? Yep. I always have my phone charging cable when I need it. I can always plug it in. It's always ready to go. There you go. There's a phone case idea. There, you know, that's that's a problem solver right there, right? So yeah. think about everything that you've bought, why you bought it, and if you can make any any improvements or, you know, and it's okay if the answer is no. I'm not, you know, no, I'm not trying to make like my ninja coffee bar. That was one of my my purchases, right? And I was like, I'm pretty happy with my coffee accessories right now. I'm not trying to get into that market. I'm good to go, right? But, you know, everything that I that I listed in that list, some stuff I didn't I I didn't see improvement in. Like I bought some Turkish bath towels and I was like, "Why did I buy these? Oh, they looked soft." But no, I mean, there's really no improvement to make there. That's okay. I'm not going to go start selling bath towels, right? Yeah. But when you start thinking about, "Oh my gosh, I keep buying these things." And why do I keep buying them? Or you start thinking about the things that you bought. You know, the other thing that you can do is an exercise that is a touch list. So everything you touch in a day, write it down. Like, okay, in my bathroom, I touched a, a bath towel and then, you know, a razor and, you know, and now go through that same list of everything you touched in a day and go, all right, why did I buy that? Did I, was it trust an important factor was, you know, did it have a certain feature that I loved? All right, now go back to that. Do I see any improvements that I could make there? Do I see any differentiations that could be made, right? Do I see any opportunities in that market? And you will find, you know, you will find them and they will really stick out to you. And then you can start going through that whole market research process. You can start going and seeing what's being sold. You can start looking all, you know, all around um, that. And don't, the last piece of advice I have to give you on that is don't give up on a problem simply because there's already a product. So many are focused on, for example, um, okay, one of our one of our people a while ago, she she was doing our product research exercises and our market research exercises, and she said, you know, my dog lapping up the water in the bowl gets water everywhere, yep. and I was thinking, oh man, you know those pet mats that are there, like they're not absorbent. So I can make an absorbent pet mat. So immediately her mind jumped from the problem to the solution. That's where you're making the mistake, right? Because she looked on the market and she saw people are already selling absorbent pet mats. So she came back to our group and she was like, somebody already did it. Everything I thought of, somebody already did. And I told her, all right, stop, wait a second. Let's go back to the problem. The dog is getting water all over the floor when they're lapping up the water in the bowl. A mat is not the only solution. Yeah. Give yourself permission to get creative. Write down every possible solution. A bib for the dog. Uh, you know, okay, a mat, um, a splash guard on the bowl. Uh, you know, every possible solution. And then like one of the solutions that we came up with when I was just like brainstorming, I was like, you know, what if there was like a tray around, like a round donut around the, the bowl that you could just lift up and dump the water out of? Oh, right? Yeah. Like a moat, like a castle moat, right? <laughs> like, I mean, that's a good idea, right? Potentially it's a good idea. So, you know, and that probably hasn't been done yet, right? But you might just think of a better mousetrap. So don't automatically, I have had so many people come to me and go, yeah, you know, Amy, I'm really passionate about kitchen stuff, 
but there's so much stuff in kitchen. And when we break down the situation of them cooking dinner for their family, we find lots of opportunities, lots of things that they touch, lots of um, areas where they could improve or actually uh, address something. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to uh, bring up the whole cable thing, don't get in the cables. You have to have a certification <laughs> from Apple and go through a long process to get legal cables. I know all about it. So I definitely do not go down that route. <laughs> Anyways, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you are, are there some product categories that have more success than others in your opinion? Um, you know, I think that you have to be careful that there is a large enough market for your product, right? So when I'm doing market research, um, I look at the size of the market, right? So you have to look at who is your customer. And if your customer is, you know, um, left-handed blonde men who golf, I, it's going to be a small market. <laughs> yeah, you know, and he, yeah, okay. You know, so you need to be able to define who your customer is, yeah. who's buying this product, and then you need to look at the market. Now, if you can be a big fish in a small pond, right? If you're the only dude selling, you know, door handles, well, <laughs> you know, you, you might have probably could be pretty good, right? Door handles is probably a large market, but you yeah. get the idea, right? If you're the only person selling something, you know, um, an accessory for this, this one type of phone, well, then you're probably going to do pretty well because you, you can capture that whole market. It's where you go into a really, really tiny market and you don't know who your customer is or you haven't defined them. And then your search volume for your main keyword is 10. <laughs> yeah. Know? That's, that's a problem. Yeah. You don't want to get too, too niched into a market because there won't be enough people there to buy it. So yeah, you got to be careful on that. And I know we kind of covered some of this, but in general, when you're dealing with like, let's say a lot of newer sellers, what is the number one biggest mistake you see new sellers doing when they're first getting started? Oh, oh I stumped her. <laughs> so many mistakes, <laughs> but I mean, I think we all make them. Um, number one is looking for a formula instead mm. of simply treating this as a business and getting to know your customer and your market. So many people are like, okay, Amy, just tell me how many reviews should it have and what's the search volume and, and, and how do I pick a product, right? Yeah. The, that is people want to know that they want to have that formula to follow. And, you know, if you study your favorite brands, they were the first to market with the new trend. They are so good at speaking to their customers and they understand that buying is a psychological, pro you know, a psychological process, right? Yeah. So I love to say this and remind people of this. People have been trading goods and services since the caveman days. <laughs> this is not rocket science, people. Simply study your market and find an opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean you have to invent something because people always assume like, well, Amy, you invented a product and I'm not trying to invent something. Well, guess what? I'm going to give you an example. So, you know, I have China trips and we go and we see, you know, and, and I'm the person who teaches people to develop unique products. Right. So, you know, we go to, we go on this trip and this is after they've been through two months, a two month long course with me learning all about why you should differentiate and how you should study your market and yada, yada, yada. Right. And we go see a keyboard factory and they're all fascinated. They're like, Oh, I'm not afraid of electronics anymore. This is so cool. Right. And we get back out on the bus and they're like, Amy, What's the deal? Keyboards are super saturated. Why would you bring us to a keyboard factory? We can't source from there. Like it was so cool, but keyboards, like that's not unique. Like how are we gonna, and I was like, come on guys, you know better than this. I taught you better than this, right? Okay, so let's think who uses keyboards, right? Do we know our, our market of who uses keyboards? All right, so yeah, that factory made really, nice keyboards really nice ones right nice. they're awesome light up gamer keyboards and i yep. was like i saw this keyboard in there and it was like purple and blue and pink and had a really badass design on it i was like so if i study my market like 
I'm in the cat market, right? I, I have cat lovers and cat people are crazy. So are dog people. If I get a really cool design of a cat and I put it across that keyboard, do you think my keyboards are going to sell? Hell yeah, they're going to sell. <laughs> you know, if I'm in the sports market and I get me a, a nice little NFL license and I put my favorite football team, the Green Bay Packers logo across my keyboard, what do you think my keyboards are going to sell for? Not saturated anymore, are they? Yeah, so unique. Yep. Don't be afraid to take a simple product. And same thing, like if you have, um, if you, don't be afraid to start small either, right? You might find a cool keyboard, you know, and we might not want to get into electronics again, like the, sure. you know, but you might find a cool water bottle, right? With um, a really cool water bottle with a unique feature or something like that. I know like they have these teapots now and coffee mugs that when you put hot water into them, they change color and you know, it reveals something cool. Um, well, you know, th there was a guy who put vote on face masks. He put vote on face masks to, to send a message for people to vote. Yep. And his face, print on demand, face masks. And his face mask sold like crazy. He made like 60,000 in his first weekend on Shopify doing print on demand face masks. Like Dang. it's, we don't have to overthink it, right? It's, it's about differentiating in a way that matters. So don't be afraid to, you don't have to go into this huge development thing. It's about studying your customer, finding an opportunity, and you might find something that you can source at your local store. You might find something that's opportune that you like golf carts, right? I yeah. mean, those little push golf carts, you could have probably found a wholesale supplier and threw some on Amazon. I bet you were, I bet you were tempted to do that, right? But, I was. <laughs> yeah, so don't, like, don't let things limit you. Instead, know the customer's needs, find those opportunities and get to market. Yeah, I learned I learned a lot about golf carts and uh, seeing the different ones from my friends and stuff like that. And I was like, man, I could design a better one than these. Like, you know, some of them, it took three different things you had to screw unscrew to get it to collapse. And I'm like, why can't it just be a one button and it collapses, right? And why can't yeah. it be super thin so it fits in your car better or your trunk, right? So yeah, yeah and you're I, the golfer, so you yeah. know that, and you know that that if you if there was a photo of that on the page of golf carts on Amazon, you'd be like, that's it, that's yeah. it, I need that one right there. Exactly, you know? one bush, <laughs> one one button push, and it's collapse, and look how thin it is, right? Yeah, there's all kinds of ways you can go with it, and that's exactly what we're talking about. But let's also talk about you know we've been talking about a lot of product research stuff. What about like launching a unique product? Why don't you step us through? kind of some tips you give on when it comes to launching a unique product. Yeah, sure. Um, well, a lot of people think that if they are launching the first ever water bottle with lights, they're like, Amy, there's no search volume for that. So I'm not gonna be able to launch it and nobody's gonna buy it. And you know, cause that's the argument that you see in all the, all the, um, the classes on using product research software. Well, you want something with incredibly high search volume so that you can fight to get to page one and then lose in a price war. That's how we do things. Anyway. <laughs> First one to the bottom. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the thing is, you know, you're still gonna do your keyword research during your process of coming up with this product idea, right? You're gonna make sure people are searching for what it is that you are selling, right? So I invented a better way to clean the cat litter box, but there's no other product on the market that is my product, right? Like yeah. it's not a litter box. It's not a litter box, it's a device to clean a litter box. There's nothing else on the market. So you would think, well, you can't sell that then. Nobody's searching for litter box cleaner. But guess what? Hmm. People are searching for litter box. And Absolutely. I can get up on that page, right? And now, you know, I can own that category for that cleaning solution, right? And then I also look for other, like my product sifts litter, right? So um, they're looking for cat litter, they're looking for litter, they're looking for sifting, they're looking for all of those things. So I just make sure that I optimize my listing and you know, we could do a whole, another podcast on listing <laughs> optimization because that's my other, my other nerdery that I love to do. But 
you know, I'm going to make sure that when I'm launching a unique product that maybe doesn't have that search volume yet exactly for my medium to long tail keyword, right? Um, I am going to make sure that I'm utilizing the keywords that people are searching for. And that what I call a seed keyword, and it's not just me, other people call it that too, but a seed keyword like litter box inside of the medium tail keyword litter box cleaner is um, still very highly searched. And so I can get creative as well with product targeting. Yeah. So when you get into your PPC, your pay-per-click advertising, remember, you can always pay for a spot at the top of a page. You can always pay for that spot, but you wanna make sure that you're super relevant for that keyword and that you're gonna convert, right? You don't wanna pay for a bunch of clicks that aren't gonna convert. So you've gotta make sure that your listing, my number one rule is we don't get to scroll down in the listing. Oh no, no, when somebody clicks our ad, we want them to go to that listing. We want them to first, they're gonna go through your photos. They're gonna go through your photos, first of all, especially if they're on mobile, because the photos are right there and they're gonna scroll yeah. through. Biggest mistake I see people make, they'll put all their work into their EBC and their main photos will suck. Yeah. And yeah. so then people just move on to their competitors and they don't even scroll down and look at their EBC. So anyway, you know, you wanna make sure your main photos, your top seven photos, you wanna make sure you have at least four photos, at least preferably six or more, because yeah. that's how you're more relevant in search, right? But those photos, I have a seven photo strategy and it works. You wanna make sure your main photo is gonna stick out, right? And it looks nice on the page and people are gonna go, ooh, I wanna click and see what that's about. They click in there. Your next photo after your main photo should feature your strongest selling point. Hmm. Your strongest selling point. So why should people buy your product over What sets product? it apart? Yeah, what sets yes. it apart? Exactly. So that's what, but really focus on why, right? This morning I was reviewing a product listing of a guy who had a glow in the dark sign, like a yard sign. And he was one of few yard signs that actually glowed in the dark. And I said, okay, it's cool that it's glow in the dark, but you're not telling the customer why they should buy a glow in the dark one. You're not getting into their psychological response on that glow in the dark. Like, okay, well, when burglars come, I want at night, they need to know that they're on video camera. Like yeah. that's important, right? So you need, that should have been his second photo right there, right? That should have been calling it out. And he showed that it was glow in the dark, but I'm like, this isn't, it's not helping you, man. Like, okay, I'm just going to scroll by and, you know, keep looking. So people focus on features and they don't focus on like, why should you buy this? So that's, that second photo has got to have that number three photo. What's included? What do we get? This is the customer's thought process. They go, why should I buy it? What do I get? Yep. So you wanna show them, okay, well, what's the size? How many do they get? What comes with it? Do you get an exercise guide with these bands? You know, like, what do they get? That's photo number three. The next photo after that is your more benefits photo. So show it in their life, right? Like, how lifestyle. do they use it and why does it matter, right? Yeah, that lifestyle photo, right? That, that again, you're psychological, you're getting in there, awesome, you know? Be safe from burglars, you know? <laughs> show, them, show them that. Um, and then your next photo is always, I love showing multiple uses of the product. So whether that's like a quad photo of, you can use it in your car, you can use it in your bathroom, you can use it at your trailer, you know, <laughs> wherever, you know, you wanna show that, you know, just like a really good infomercial, you wanna show all the places that this product can be used, all the ways that this product can be used, or if it doesn't have a lot of uses, you wanna call out additional benefits. So, you know, is there something additional that you could do? And then your last photo, you want to do a gift photo. Show it as a gift, right? And move this around seasonally. But that's how you launch a unique product. You really got to start with your photos. You got to make sure the right keywords are in your listing in the right order. And, um, and yeah, it's, 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 not, it's a fallacy if you think that you're launching a unique product and nobody's going to find it because keywords are a beautiful thing. And you got this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We are definitely going to get Amy back on again because uh, I know her and I will sit here and probably talk for two more hours and we'll probably lose some people. So Amy, real quick, besides the podcast, the seller round table podcast that you host, tell everybody else, uh, how do they get a hold of you for your coaching, uh, the website, everything, give them some information so they can come listen to you more and get a hold of you. 
Yeah, well, um, I am the owner of amazingathome.com. So just go to amazingathome.com. If you want me to review your listing, I'll do a free listing review for you. Just click underneath the services menu and you'll see I have a little listing review pop out. Um, and you can contact me anytime. I've got a blog with a ton of great training, free training, free videos, information. Um, so Amazing at Home on YouTube, amazingathome.com. Amazing at Home Facebook group is where we do tons of free training. We have a mastermind group. It's awesome, really fun, $49 a month. We go live twice a week. We teach you product research, validation, all the things. It's really fun, great, great group of people in there, um, you know, business building folks. And it's, it's just a good, it's a feel good community, man. I love it. We don't allow mean people. Mean people get kicked out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so would would love to have you guys anytime and uh, and thanks again for having me. All right, thanks, Amy. I really appreciate being on the Ecom Wiz podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.